Dr. Ed Hawkins at the National Centre for Atmospheric Science at the University of Reading in the UK. And my interests are in climate variability uh, and climate predictability. I think what a lot of people don't realise is that the history of climate change is a very long one. History of climate science, it was started with Joseph Fourier back in the 1820s when he first started wondering what set the temperature of the Earth. And he, he, he's trying to work out what should the temperature of the Earth be given the information he had about how much radiation we had from the sun, for example. And so he started some very quick, easy, dirty calculations. Um, and he couldn't explain the fact that the Earth was not a ball of ice. He ended up with a temperature of the Earth well below zero degrees Celsius. Uh, and so he spent a lot of time trying to work out what was wrong with his very simple model of, of what the temperature of the Earth should be. Uh, so he tried various things. He uh, first thought that perhaps there's another source of energy in the system and that there must be energy coming from the centre of the Earth. Geothermal energy was helping heat the planet up and he quickly ruled that out by, by doing some calculations about how much energy was coming from below. And he eventually concluded that there must be extra energy coming from outer space. He thought the temperature of, the, um, of empty space must be higher than, than absolute zero and hence providing some energy. But he also noted while doing that that there was a potential for the atmosphere to have some property which increased the temperature instead. Um, and that kind of started the ball rolling on people thinking about uh, what might be that setting the temperature of the planet a bit more and whether the atmosphere is involved um, in, in that. So one of the next important people is Claude Poulier, who was the first to measure the fact that there was downwelling infrared radiation from the atmosphere. And so this was the first hint that perhaps there's something in the atmosphere which is intercepting infra infrared radiation coming from the surface and uh, downwelling it back to the Earth, providing some extra energy effectively in, in the atmosphere. So the next person in the story is John Tyndall, who's an Irishman uh, who did some very careful experiments in London in the 1860s on the absorption of infrared radiation by various gases. He, he tried lots of different gases. He had uh, normal air and water vapour and carbon dioxide and methane and other hydrocarbons uh, measuring how much infrared radiation was absorbed by these gases and he found that various greenhouse gases as they're now called, so carbon dioxide and methane and so on, they absorb infrared radiation um, in, in, this, in this laboratory experiment and so this is the basis for, for what we now call the greenhouse effect. All of these figures who were doing this historical research at the time, they were not really concerned with the human influence on climate their entire motivation was explaining ice ages, which had been discovered um, in the 1830s or so. To, they re realised that the Earth had been much colder at times because they could see the, these valleys carved by enormous glaciers, but they couldn't explain how the Earth could change its temperature so, so much between these warm and cold phases. And so they were looking for reasons that might cause the Earth's temperature to change by, a, by such a large amount. And this is why they were looking at various mechanisms um, such as um, changes in the Earth's orbit. This was, a, this was an important influence. So um, a man named James Kroll put forward the theory that changes in the Earth's orbit um, would provide different amounts of radiation to the, to the Earth and therefore cause changes in temperature. And that was one school of thought on one side. Uh, and that was further developed by Milankovitch in the 1920s. They're called Milankovitch cycles. Yeah. They should probably be called Kroll cycles. Um, and on the other side, there were these um, other group who thought that these changes in the Earth's temperature were due to things like greenhouse gases and so on. And so there was this discussion um, going on between these two groups. Um, and now, of course, we know that both are important, of course. We know that the, the timing of these of, of ice ages are set by the changes in the Earth's orbit, but those small changes in radiation received by the Earth are amplified by the changes in greenhouse gases as well. So what was it? two theories in, is, in fact, one one theory coming, coming together to explain these temperatures changes. Yeah, it's important to realise that they were not interested in the human influence side of it. You know, they're, they're, they're doing this science to explain what they could see going on around them, um, and, that, and that is important. It, they weren't trying to prove the carbon dioxide warmed the planet for, for any particular reason, apart from to try and explain what the observations that they saw. So in, in the late 1890s, we have um, a Swedish um, professor, Svante Arrhenius, who was the next person to, to start investigating this problem. Uh, and he, again, he was mainly concerned with explaining ice ages, what could cause these large temperature changes um, in Earth's history. But also at this time, it was becoming realised that um, 
the emissions of greenhouse gases from human activity could potentially be changing the composition of the Earth's atmosphere and therefore the role of carbon dioxide could be, could be more than just explaining Earth's history, it could be potentially changing how things change in the future. And this is becoming more important um, in the late 1890s. So Svante Arrhenius, he went away and again sort of did some very simple, relatively simple calculations on what would happen if the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was doubled, the kind of thought experiment if you like. Um, and he came up with a number of around about four degrees or so for the change in global temperature if you double carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And this is the, the first estimate, if you like, of what we now call climate sensitivity. So my scientific hero uh, in, in this story is a, um, an amateur, an amateur meteorologist called Guy Stuart Callender. Um, he was a professional steam engineer, and that was what he, he did as, as a day job. Um, but in the evenings um, and weekends, he used to collect temperature measurements from around the world. And he, he was a very avid meteorologist. He took measurements in his back garden. Um, and he just enjoyed collecting data from temperatures all, around, all over the world. Uh, and in the 1930s, um, he started to put together um, a global average temperature. He, he put together readings from 150 stations all over the world um, and averaged them all together to try and get an estimate of what the globe was doing um, instead of just looking at one or two locations. Um, and what he saw was the Earth was warming up over the previous 50 years. So he had data from about 1880 up to the mid-1930s, so about 50 years, and he could see the, the, the temperature of the planet warming up according to his data. So what Canada also did was actually take the available carbon dioxide observations. So building on the work of Arrhenius, who had started to suggest that perhaps human activity might influence temperatures, although it's happening fast, although the rate of emissions was thought to be far too slow to affect global temperatures back in the late 1800s. But by the start of the 20th century, the rate of emissions had gone up an awful lot. Um, and so it had begun to realise that perhaps the rate of human emissions of greenhouse gases could affect the global temperature. And so Calendar also collected for the first time the available carbon dioxide measurements and he showed that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere had gone up um, because of human activity and he linked that to the rise in temperatures that he saw. And he did again did some simple calculations like Arrhenius had done and showed that carbon dioxide could explain about half of the observed temperature rise that he'd seen in his data. And this is really the first time that someone has suggested that human activity had caused carbon dioxide to increase and then it had increased global temperatures. This is the first sort of attribution of a change in global temperature to human activity. So Canada presented this as, as an amateur to the fellows of the Royal Meteorological Society um, and it was generally regarded as very interesting but with, it was treated with a lot of scepticism. Um, people didn't really believe that human activities could affect something as big as the Earth's climate. That was a, a large part of it. Um, a large part of it was we didn't have enough information about the absorption spectrum of the atmosphere to really do the detailed calculations necessary to work out how the radiation propagated through the atmosphere. That had to wait. Um, and so th I think there was quite rightly some scepticism because we didn't have all the information we needed. Um, but this really kick-started um, more research and to try and understand what was going on in the atmosphere. Um, and this really re-sparked the, the whole interest in, in this discussion because it had been quite quiet for the previous 30, 40 years and this really re energised the whole discussion. So, I, I, you know, I, I think he's very underappreciated. This book describes the life and work um, of, of, of Guy Stewart Callender um, and the greenhouse effect was actually called the Callender effect uh, for, for many years. So my main interest is in climate variability, which has become more and more popular recently because of what we've seen happen to global temperatures with the recent relative slowdown in, in the rate of global temperature increase. But for many years people have realised that climate variability plays a very important role in how climate will change for a particular person, for example. If they're living in one location, variability is the single most important factor for how they experience the weather and climate. So what is the difference between weather and climate? My favourite saying, um, which um, was uh, a chap called Robert Heinlein came up with, is climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. So if you look out the window um, and you see the weather, that is what, that's what you get on a day-to-day -day basis. The climate is what you might expect to happen given a long-term average or you know, average conditions over a very long period. Um, and so understanding how 
variability may change in the future or how it will affect different people in different locations, I think is, is, is what drives me at the moment. So over the, over the last 50 years or so, we've seen temperatures, global temperatures increase, um, especially up to the late 1990s. And then since the late 1990s, temperatures have increased at a slightly slower rate than before the late 1990s. This has been termed the hiatus or the slowdown or the pause. Um, and it's been much discussed um, in amongst scientists, uh, in the media, um, and, and so on, about the various reasons for why temperatures have not increased as fast as we might have expected or as they did before. There are many possible explanations and many possible reasons, but I think the most important point is that it is not unexpected. We know that there is um, a long-term trend in, in temperatures, but we fully expect that to have periods where it is the global temperatures are warming very quickly and periods where global temperatures are not warming so quickly. And this is because there is um, natural variations in how the Earth's climate behaves. We see trends, but we also see variability, which will temporarily mask a, a long-term trend for some periods and enhance it at other times. So we expect to see periods where temperatures increase quite quickly and periods where temperatures do not increase so quickly. Uh, and and we, we know that the planet undergoes these, these changes on decadal timescales, and this is what we believe is part of the explanation for what we're seeing now. So the role of climate variability is very important for global temperatures, as we've seen with the recent temperature slowdown, but it's also very important for other aspects of the climate system, like Arctic sea ice. We've seen Arctic sea ice decline since, the, since 1979, since we have very good satellite observations. It declined particularly quickly up to about 2007, when we saw a very extreme low minimum um, in the summer sea ice extent. Um, and many people expected then the Arctic ice to disappear very quickly after seeing that short trend from about 2000 to 2007. They saw the ice melting very quickly and they said, oh, it's going to disappear very quickly. Um, but of course, um, many others said, hang on a minute, you know, that's not necessarily how things will, will work because there are these variations in the climate system. And I think the, the fact the Arctic ice hasn't declined as quickly since 2007 shows that perhaps variability was playing a, a role in some of the pre-2007 melt um, and the variability is going the other way now um, and causing the ice to melt less quickly. Um, so variability is very important, we mustn't forget about it, we must keep communicating the fact that there are long-term trends caused by human influence, but there is variability that happens on top of those trends. Unfortunately, I think, that the media jump on the extreme views, of course. So when 2007 happened, everyone said, oh, there's going to be no sea ice in five years' time. You know, certain characters are still repeating that. Um, and I think that's very unhelpful, because we knew there was potential for decadal variability in the whole climate system, and sea ice in particular. Um, and that didn't stop some people making some rather rash proclamations, unfortunately. We have to point out when people are being too alarmist, as well as yes. being too cautious, and that we have to do that more and more, because we have to be seen to be fair and rigorous and robust. So I very much enjoy blogging and tweeting um, about climate change. I, I go and give public talks, which I find particularly uh, very interesting to talk to, to people about what they, what they understand about climate change and um, what they think pe may, people may want to do about it. Um, going and discussing these issues, I think, is very important. I would definitely encourage any climate scientist to go and talk to, give talks to schools and the public um, to, to try and learn how to communicate their, their very detailed science uh, to a far wider audience. We've known since about 1938 that global temperatures were increasing and that carbon dioxide was likely responsible for at least part of the increase. Uh, and that increase has continued to this day. We're continuing to emit greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We're continuing to see global temperatures increase.